Hey, GovCon Giants, your host, Eric Coffey. And today we're bringing you another guest for the GovCon Giants podcast, Gene Albanese Payne. This is actually episode 110, right? Not counting the Making of Giants episodes. Uh, but listen, stay tuned. This episode, Gene Albanese Payne, her company, uh, she has 20 years experience of doing diversity training in the workplace. And so she brings all that experience into her business that was founded back in 2014. And now she's supporting the Department of Defense, Treasury, NASA, Homeland Security, Department of Energy, and other organizations providing workplace and cultural training and also translation services. That's right, translation services. She is bilingual. She is a disabled veteran of the Navy. And so she's bringing us all this information. Even if you are not in that space, in that industry, I guarantee there's something that you can learn from this episode because she talks about not only the business side of it, but her personal side and how she built up her stamina and all of her life experiences that got her to the point where she's at today to where she's now got a fully successful thriving businesses with only a couple more hires. It's going to be running on its own. So definitely stay tuned for this organization to learn how you can build a similar type of business and grow it in the same way. So stay tuned. I hope you enjoy this episode today with our next upcoming giant. Well, hi, Eric. Uh, my name is uh, Jean Ibanez Payne. I am the CEO of TI Verbatim Consulting. Welcome, uh, welcome today. Thank you. Now, thank where, you. Are you, where are you based out of? So, we have two locations one in West Virginia and another one in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Ah, uh, uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Okay. Yeah, yeah. West Virginia. I've never been to West Virginia. What is that like? It's, it's, it's a beautiful town. Uh, I think it's very much misrepresented, uh, very friendly people, a lot of great opportunities, especially for any uh, 8A company. In West Virginia? Yes, yes. Oh, you got to tell me that. Yes, <laughs> yes. So uh, I would have the, never guessed that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I tell you, um, I always advocate for the small business office in West Virginia. And uh, they have, uh, as you know, there's not a lot of diversity in uh, West Virginia. Right. So there's right. not a lot of 8A companies. So contrary to, uh, you know, to being in D.C. or Richmond, Virginia, right, mm. where uh, there's a caseworker, as we call it, for 78 days, right, or even 100 right. in D.C., in West Virginia, you're only looking at seven to eight Ooh. per person, and they have the best small business office that you can ask for. You know, that's very, I, I love that because that. Before we got started, you said to me, hey, Eric, I want to come on and talk to 8As and small business about strategies, right? And ways to win. You came out the gate with enough strategy immediately because I've seen that in a smaller states like Rhode Island, where there was only eight 8A companies in a whole state. And then if you narrow down the construction, there was three. So yeah, I, I love that already. That's yeah. great. That's and, great and you know what, Eric, uh, what, is, what is fascinating is I, I see, I call it fascinating is that most times it takes 24 to 72 hours for a contracting officer to hear from any SBA office. I mean, I can attest to my SBA office. Sometimes they respond within 30 minutes, within one hour, wow. Saturday, Sunday. I mean, and they're so committed to the 8A company and the contracting officers love, love the SBA office because they're like, we have never seen anything like this before. I was about to say that I, contrary to the, what the horror stories that I hear from other SBA offices, this is a total 180. Yes. That's amazing. I think you got, I think you got really lucky. You have to be very strategic <laughs> before you get that 8A certification. I love that. I love that. So tell us, uh, uh, I know that your slogan is wanting to help people work better together. Tell us about your business and what kind of, what industries are you in? So TI Verbatim Consulting, um, we are in the business of, we like to help people work better together. And uh, what we do, we do cultural assessments and literally, Eric, that is coming in into the workplace and analyzing the, the people the processes, the policies, the core values, and making recommendations to improve the culture. Uh, we also do um, workforce training and language translation and uh, interpretation. And we do that across 10 plus, uh, you know, different states in the U.S. Now, what I think that I, I really, and doing my research to, to interview today, 
And I said to myself, wow, you didn't pick the typical IT, cyber, <laughs> staffing. You know, you, you didn't pick those typical what people seem as like, this is what the government buys, right? The most of, and I'm going to go after this area. How did you pick those, those three areas, those three disciplines to, to work in? How did you choose those? So I want to go back to 2014 when I first started the company. Fair. And uh, I, I did uh, human resources, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, when I, I came in into the government environment, I had no experience uh, doing any government uh, work. Okay. And, uh, but I knew that I was really committed to, uh, to my passion, which is to, to help people work better together. Either that is through improving the morale in the workplace, to workforce training, to leadership development. And for me, it was important to, to stick to what I was great at. Mm. Because often what you see is people want to follow the money trail. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. if you don't, if you don't stick to what you are successful and what you love to do, you're not going to be great. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, it's like, you know what, if you tell me to, to do, um, you know, to do it cybersecurity and any of those things, I mean, I'm not going to be engaged and we love doing what we do. And we have such a great, successful team. And Eric, I mean, we have been in business since really 2015. Right. We have close to 70 employees. We've wow. got 32 plus contracts. Oh, we wow. will be around nine to million dollars by the end of this year. But Amazing. it's really because the passion that we have for what we do and, and we don't settle for just, okay, we're going to make money. I want to make sure that we're doing something that makes a difference. No, that's incredible. Those, the, that's, uh, it's, Again, going back to what we said before the show, uh, there's so many eight eight companies that are not hitting those marks. They're underutilizing the programs. They're not maximizing opportunities. Um, you know, let's let's talk about that. How is it that you're able to to grow that quickly, that fast? All right, we so we gave the first checkbox, West Virginia office. That was great. So that right. all right. So you're in a place where the SBA is supporting you and helping you, and very responsive, and that is of tremendous value, especially when you're in these programs. You need, I don't think a small business understand, but if you're gonna be in an 8A program, you have to be side by side with your SBA rep, your BOS. They're extremely valuable. So tell me what else, what other things are you doing? So so I, I will tell you that the SBA is gonna be an advocate for you. Right. They're going to support you, but they're not gonna do your work. So mm. there's the preconceived idea of many small businesses that they think that, okay, if I got my 8A certification is my SBA rep's responsibility to be looking out for contracts for me. Mm. And that is not going to happen. I mean, I think that has been the big reality check for some companies where it has been four years and they still haven't gotten their first contract. Right. We actually got our first contract in two months. Okay. Nice. Because we were prepared and we were actually admitted into the SBA 8A program six months early. Okay. So you have the you have to wait two years. But if you're ready, they let you in six months early. Okay. So this is this is what I I, I this is what we did and this is what I tell people you got to be procurement ready. Okay. You got to be procurement ready for uh, the 8A program. If you're not it, it doesn't matter if you have the 8A certification. So so what does it look like? When we first started the business, we actually won our first contract to an open competition, okay? okay. Not set aside or anything. We went for it, and we were strategic in how we responded, and we won the contract. Okay. But up until that point, right, for the first year and a half or two years, I was always, I call it being a lobbyist to the government and to the agencies that I wanted to do business with. Hey, um, so for example, we do a lot of work with the Department of Energy. I was always talking to the contracting officers. Hey, uh, this is what we do. This is what we know how to do well. And by the way, we are getting, uh, we have, we're submitting our 8A um, applications and we should have it on this date. And then when we got it, I was constantly following up with them to establish and cultivate a relationship. Okay, right. so that is so important is that 
there's all this pre-work that people have to do before they get before they get their 8A, right? Once you get your 8A certification, again, like I said, it doesn't guarantee you're going to be getting contracts left and right. You have to know your customer. You have to understand what is it that they're buying. But also, you have to be doing your research. I am, there has been several contracts when we I go through the forecasts and I look for what are, who are those companies who are graduating from the program, okay? Can I develop a relationship with them? And then I start contacting them. But also, you know, how you respond to sources sought, how you do white papers. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a lot of people over there that do white papers, but they are very successful. So you just have to go into the forecast and look, okay, so-and-so has it, I can do that. Don't do an unsolicited proposal because that opens up a can of worms for the contract <laughs> officer, right? Right, right, so right. What we right. do, I do a lot. We do a lot of white papers, okay? You, but you also have to customize it. Hey, dear, dear um, Eric, I know that you're the contracting officer for this. He, I noticed that you have a requirement coming up. Here's a white paper on how we can address your issues. Can you pass it on to the program office? So that has been our tremendous success for the 8A program. And then once you start doing a good job, guess what? Contracting officers talk to each other. We have mm -hmm. had people from uh, the energy department telling me, hey, somebody from HHS told me that you do great translation. The same thing for cultural assessment. So that is, I would say, um, I wouldn't even call it a secret sauce. You just have to be very strategic when you get your 8A certification and be ready to run because it's only nine years. Yeah, you say procurement ready. I love that term, procurement ready. Is that did you learn that from somewhere? Or is that just something that you came up with? Uh, no, no. Um, so there's a program called the VIP in yep. Maryland. It's for mm -hmm. veterans, yep. uh, the Veterans Institute for Procurement. Right. And one of the big things that they really kind of like ingrain on your head is, is you've got to be procurement ready. Mm -hmm. Because if you are, if you win an award. Okay, and you don't have, uh, you know, your, uh, you don't have Bonding, the funding, insurance, right? Right. You don't Capital, have insurance, right? You don't have a credit you line. You don't have vendors, right? And your employees are complaining to the government that you're not paying them on time. Right. That's not being procurement ready. It's having that infrastructure to be right. ready. Right. And don't have the Gmail account once you become a contracting person, right? That is just the most horrible thing. Because it's like gmpain at gmail.com. People are going to see that. You know what? You're still operating at that very right small level. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you. I I, um, I tell them not to dress the part. I mean, you have to look the part. You got to dress the part. So, wow. No, that's great. I actually, tell me more about the white papers. Now, okay, you're going at the forecast list and you're writing white papers. I didn't even. I, I've never heard that strategy before. Right. Um. So I've heard it. Okay, let me take that back. I've heard it for like IT. I've never heard it for anything outside of the IT sector because they're usually asking us to submit white papers to solve problems, but you're submitting them unsolicited. Mm -hmm. So tell me yeah. about that. Yes. So uh, basically the white papers are you know, very simple. Keep it to two or three pages, including mm -hmm. your title page. Okay. And um, I, what we typically do is that we customize it to a, um, a specific opportunity. So let's say, um, Eric, that you have been, uh, you know, uh, you're an aided company and you know that that consistently um, that opportunity has been awarded as a direct award every four or five years, right? And then, you know, that company is going to be graduating, which not necessarily means that the government wants them to come back and be subs, right? That's true. It, right. it, so it doesn't always mean that a government likes the incumbent. Right. Agree. Okay? Agree. So, Agree. so what, um, what we do is uh, you do your research to determine, okay, what are they looking for? Is there a public PWS? Can you go to GovWin? Can you go to the federal procurement uh, system to see what the award was for? And then you start putting the pieces together, right? And so once you understand what the PWS looks like and you look at your core competencies, and I will tell you, do not tell them that you can do something that you can't do. They will figure it out, okay, when it's time to perform. I should or, I should have like 50 things on my list. Exactly. It's like, that's why I tell people we're great at doing three things. Not 10, not 15, three things, okay? Right. So basically, you, you do your homework, you look at the PWS, you do your research, and then you start drafting a white paper, and then you align your core competencies to their need. And then you you let them know exactly how they can reach you, and and then you package it and you send it to them, and then you follow up. Don't just send it and not follow up. Right. Follow up. Would that be similar to how you respond to a source of thought or RFI? Very similar. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yes. All right. Except no, because again, we have those it. those documents that we respond to using source of thoughts. I can see it's very similar in nature, except you're not responding to something they, they put out. You're looking at some needs and you're addressing it. So you know what? I'm so glad that you just brought up the source of song. And this is more of also another nugget um, is when we respond to source of song, we're very deliberate with a response. Uh, many people think that, oh yeah, you know what? If I'm responding to the source of song and I just give them a can explanation or just a can three or four page document that they're going to be okay with that. No, you got to be deliberate, right? You know that you have to be deliberate. You have to do your homework. You have to find the pain points. And then you got to customize it so you can shape that requirement. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people don't understand about shaping requirements, and they they sound, it sounds like something illegal, but they don't. If you understand what stage the government's at in the cycle, then right. you'll you'll know what that means. Wow, that's wonderful. And again, I go back and I think to myself, right? You're in an industry or space that I would be like, the government buys language services. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yep. What, what, like, what do they do with that? Are you, are, I mean, t t tell me more, like, what are they, what are they translating? Oh, so we have, we have had a couple of contracts with, uh, with uh, DHS. Okay. To uh, do work for TSA, which I'm sure you're familiar with TSA. Right. We right? all are. Yes. Uh, FDIC, some of those, uh, you know, if you have a bank account, you know what the FDIC is, yeah. so some of those documents. Also, oh. with, uh, HHS, right? Uh, if you go to the HHS, uh, NIDA, NIDA, all the uh, Spanish uh, information and literature in how to fight uh, how to fight drug addiction, we have done a lot of that. We have done oh. a lot of uh, also okay. for DEA. Okay, okay, okay. And right now, you said you provide over a hundred different languages. Yes. Now, how did you? How, when you started, how many did you provide? When you first Two. got started, Two. Two. the ones Two. you knew. <laughs> the ones yeah, you that, do. So, so when I first started the company, um, I, I spent 15 years in the utility industry and I was commuting 75 miles each way. And I had no experience with government contracting, Eric, whatsoever. And okay. I came, I came home one day and I told my husband, I said, you know what? I don't want to do this commute anymore. I'm, I'm done. And I'm going to start a company. I'm going to be a government contractor. And my husband looked at me like, uh, okay, uh, you don't know anything about anything. Do you know what Sam is? You know what Dunst? I'm like, no, but it's going to work out. So uh, I, I, we started with uh, with language translation and interpretation, and that's how the TI verbatim came about, right? Verbatim, mm. uh, word by word. And then um, and then after that, kind of morphed into other things. Um, so really, the, the, the pipeline of language translation is we have a pipeline of uh, certified translators. So anytime that there's a need from the customer, we just, you know, reach to our translators to for availability and that we coordinate their needs. I like that. I like that. Yeah. I like that. And and again, what so so now you didn't know anything about government contracting. Why did you pick government contracting? And why did you choose government contracting specifically? Oh my gosh. I don't you know what? I don't know. It just to me it sounded sexy. <laughs> I was like, oh you know what? Government contracting. Everybody talks about government contracting. I'm like might as well just try it. And uh, I go back to my husband telling me, he's like, uh, like two or three months later after I quit my job, he says, so what's your plan B if some of this, if it doesn't work out? And I'm like, there's no plan B. It's going to work out, right? That was in 2014. And uh, again, fast forward to, uh, to 2021 and we've just been so successful. But I think it goes back to you got to be intentional. You got to be deliberate, right? right. You got to have a plan. You have to have a strategy. You have to execute. And so that's what I have done the entire time. What gave you that confidence to know that it would work out for you? I have always had confidence. Okay. Um, you know, my father, um, so I'm from Colombia, South America, and right. uh, I was born here in the U.S. And uh, my father came to the U.S. and he worked blue collar jobs. He, uh, he earned money to go back to Colombia and buy his uh, his business, and then I came back when I was I was 15 years old, and um, my father always uh, told me, and I know that you have this uh, that you're a Spanish audience as well. He told me that in Spanish is tomar uh, dos uh, toma, tomar dos pasos para adelante, pero ni uno para atrás para coger impulso. So basically, what he was telling me, he says, I, I want you always to take two steps forward, but never even one back for impulse. OK, mm -hmm. and so he has always had the mentality, the entrepreneur mentality. And uh, 
and he always pushed me outside my comfort zone that, you know what? You need to be working for yourself. You should not be working for anybody else. So he really gave me that confidence that I needed to push me outside the comfort zone to go and do it. Was it easy? It wasn't easy at all. It was the first two years, Eric, were the two toughest years of my life, aside from joining the military and not knowing how to speak English. But I tell you what, you know, if you commit yourself to doing it, you're going to get it done. No regrets. What would you tell a small business that is listening to this and um, it's what's interesting is, and I, and I love women entrepreneurs, so uh, I'm a huge fan already. Uh, I just had another woman entrepreneur on a, a few hours ago and she did the same thing. She quit her job and started cold Turkey is, which, I mean, what would you tell someone sitting around? Like, they're like, I can't do that. I, I can't quit my job and just start cold Turkey. How did you do it? Like, how did you, how were you able to support yourself in doing that? <laughs> How'd you replace that oh, wow. income? I should say, forget support. So how do you replace the income or did you not replace the income or did you save money to start? Get me like, how do you tell that the, you know, the younger version of yourself, Hey, you could do that. So the first thing is, is anything that you set yourself up to do, you will get it done. No questions. You just have to have the commitment. Amen. You have to have the passion and you have to have the drive to never give up. Right. You have to have a support group. For me, it was my family, right? My brother, my dad, my husband, who will kick me out to the street to go and sell. You're going to do it. You're great. Get it done. Just right. go. So that's the biggest, the first thing that, you, that I had to have was that support system from my family, right? Once I, I got that check, uh, in regards to uh, resources and, and, and money, we have been saving money, uh, you know, the 401k right. savings. And basically, um, oh, so the funny thing is that after my husband asked, what's your plan B? Uh -huh. Two years later, he quit his job to come and work for the company. Ooh. So now you have gone from two people making six figures, right? Uh -huh. To nothing. Only just his military uh, pension, which was not a lot. We uh, basically, we uh, we sold our dream home. We... Um, you uh, sold your dream home. We cashed out our 401ks, okay? We made some drastic, drastic changes that we needed to make. And we, I press on, never look back. That is that is remarkable. I, I, that's commitment. Yes. That's, that is, you know what that says to me? That's burning the bridges behind you. Yes. You went, you set the bridges on fire. And you said, you know what? This is going to work. Yes. And what do you... Obviously, 70 employees, $10 million <laughs> sales. You proved that it was yep. worth it. Yep. Wow. 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 So if everyone's listening out there and you're asking yourself, you know, what do you think? I mean, this is, she's, she's telling you, um, that's wonderful. I, I'm, I feel like we need a moment of silence. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm always, you know, but also, you know, one of the things I have learned is, uh, being humble and being compassionate, right? Uh, give back, reach back. As you are developing and you're learning, there's always opportunities to help other people, right? Who are upcoming. And uh, I always tell people, do not take for granted that person that is just coming up because you don't know where they're gonna be in three or four or five years. Okay, so don't ever close the door on people that have potential, that have energy, that want to grow. Help them, mm -hmm. right? Because you never know where you're going to be. The world turns. You, you don't know where you're going to be five or six years from now. Yeah. And so I, I, I always, let me tell you, can I, can I show you something? Yeah, certainly. This is something that I have here. I don't know if you can read it. Hold on, I'll make you big. It's me humble. It says, I still remember the days I pray for the things I have now. Oh, I love that. Okay. And I, th this keeps me grounded here because I think that's so important that I, we never forget where we came from, right? And then also why you started the company. For us, it was to create an environment where people felt valued and respected. That's the huge thing. It's non-negotiable. Uh, for us as a company, uh, I came up with... Um, 14 fundamental behaviors that we have to have as a company. 
And I would encourage any small business out there that, you know, I know we have core values and we have mission, but you got to have some fundamental behaviors that you hold people accountable to. And we have done that in our uh, company. You know, like the, number one is as a CEO, I always have your back. Okay. You know, practice, uh, you know, um, blameless problem solving, know when to move on. And so those are the things that I would tell people that when you start in the company, you're building a team, it's so important to be on the same page, but also to have compassion and be humble because it's a people business, right? Right, right. So. No, totally, totally, big time. Wow, man, let me tell you, I, I, I have not asked you any questions on my list. <laughs> You're just rolling. You're just rolling it. Uh, I, I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, Maybe we need a part two. I, I think we're going to need a part two. I haven't even, I've not read one question off my list. I'm still in like the first paragraph of your information. Uh, it, so you start off with language services. Tell me about, again, I, I think, because I'm really truly fascinated by what you're doing. Um, you know, workplace culture assessment. Mm -hmm. Explain to me, like, give us an example of what that looks like for a, a government agency. Okay. So for us, uh, we have done seven, eight cultural assessments in our company. And we actually created a proprietary model that we have internally, right? Nobody, nobody has a, a model like we do. We do what is called a qualitative and quantitative analysis. So we have uh, government agencies that will call us or uh, they might be a procurement and they want us to, let's say that they're having a lot of attrition, right? Or they're having a lot of EEO complaints. They're having a lot of discrimination issues. FEVS course, if you're familiar with those, sometimes those are the engagement surveys that they do. Mm -hmm. uh, they might be really high, meaning that, oh, things are going great. But then people are, people are filing EEO reports and, they're, and people are leaving and, and minorities are not getting promoted. So, so we, we will work with them on coming in and analyzing what we call the, the, the people, the processes and the procedures, the core values. Uh, and we do focus groups, one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, interviews. Uh, we, uh, we work uh, closely with them. On, um, you know, when we do the focus groups, uh, we, we assess their strategy plans, their, their, all their information internally to really try to understand from an unbiased perspective, what is causing all that chaos in the workplace, right? And after we do that, to, uh, which it, it lasts like six months, we we do a profile report, okay? And I don't know if you have, if you're familiar with um, you know 360 assessments, which is the uh, the assessments that people will do on individuals. So oh, yes, yeah, so when you first hire them, right? is that the one when you first hire people? Yes. So they, they, they do 360 assessments and they'll say, okay, you know, what's great about Eric? What does Eric need to work on? For okay. us, we do it for the entire organization, right? While working with leaderships. And so we give them an opportunity to really kind of understand what's working with the organization, what's not working, what's missing. And then also we do a multi-year strategic plan and how to address every single aspect of, uh, of that. And so, like I said, we, we have now uh, conducted many of them and our unique approach is really the qualitative and quantitative analysis that really, there's really nobody out there that does it like us right now. Nice. Um, is your GSA scheduled for language translation services? Yes, and also for professional services. We have some administrative support, marketing, and we're always trying to augment that. That's part of the evolution as a business, right? Right. Is to augment the GSA schedule. Um, we have a facilities clearance. We just obtained our ISO 9000 2015 certification. I saw that. Uh, which is I don't awesome. know about the facility clearance. That's good. I'm going to make yes. a note of that. Yes. And I'll tell you, uh, that's, that's another great investment, um, maturity investment, the ISO uh, certification, because it really speaks to the quality control process for your organization. Nice. Uh, I see you're on Navy Seaport. Yes. Is that for the administrative support? No, for technical support services. Technical support. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. What do you else do you see yourself headed? Um, again, you're just starting, man. You're just cranking up. Where, like, where, where do you see yourself? Uh, where do you see CIVC five years out? Oh, you know, I, I, we're just having fun. I love that. We, we are just having fun. I, I started the company for work-life balance and to be content. 
and I'm not afraid to uh, to say it. Uh, many people will ask me, "Wow, oh my gosh, you you're so aggressive. You have so much energy. Don't you want to be a twenty million dollar company, two hundred person?" I just want to have fun, right. you know. I right. mean, this is what we have done up until now, uh, creating an environment where we're taking the customers. Uh, I know we're delivering nothing but excellence, but we are also taking care of our employees. So they want to come to work every day, every day. Um, that's what we want to keep doing. We want to keep, um, uh, you know, being very strategic and deliberate and intentional in what we do. And yeah, just have fun. Um, I will say you do have a ton of energy. Uh, you came on with, you came on bringing the energy before we even hit record. So you, you came on with your energy, like shining through that camera before we even hit record. Uh, there has to be something that like a bad time. You tell us the good times. It's got to be a bad time that you want to share with people. Because uh, while we do appreciate all the energy and all the good times, people it's like, come on. There has to be something that was hard. Like, I mean, HR or like, you know, I mean, obviously not something that's personal that you can share, but uh, what's some aspect of the business that you do find difficult to do that maybe you hire someone else out to do it? You know, I will tell you that um, when you work hard and and you don't win, it can be hard. Uh, my, one of my pet peeves, and the, the and the and the team knows this, is I, I don't I don't tolerate disrespect in the workplace. Um, and uh, that is one thing. If they want to see me upset, I think we'll go back to those fundamental behaviors that I was telling you that um, people blame other people for their mistakes instead of saying, hey, what's the mission? That's one of my big, big pet peeves. Uh, the other one is um, we're okay with making mistakes. We call that investments. So they know fundamental behavior, number one, I will always have your back as the CEO, right? Um, but if, if there's no, sometimes no deliberate strategy and, and, and things cause um, hiccups or let's see colleagues to maybe work extra hours because somebody didn't do their work. Uh, sometimes that can be like a, one of my pet peeves, right? Right, right? But you know, we, we work very well together and uh, we have our moments in our team where we are very candid to each other. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, there's times where we do get frustrated. When you first started out and you're starting this business, have you ever ran a business before? No. <laughs> how did you know how to even price your services? How did you know what they were worth? How did you know the value of your services? <laughs> That's funny you asked that. Ah. So um, it's all about strategy, right? Yes, uh, absolutely. And, uh, I remember our first contract with the Department of Energy to do a culture assessment. And I was told by somebody that don't go after that contract. It's already, what do they call it? Cooked or already set right. up for somebody. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so I would not even look at it. It was an open, open competition. Okay. Right. And uh, I said, no, I said, we're going to go for it. We know how to do this work and we're going to price it in a way that we might have to take some risk. Okay. And we did. We probably underpriced that contract like by more than 50 percent okay mm. so we we want the contract on the fact that the value piece right we could deliver but also i don't price. think that there was anybody else of any of Jeez, price. who uh you know who priced our stuff as low as we did so that was the first one it's like how do you price it right sometimes mm. sometimes you have to you got to take some risk right to uh, for pricing Right. The same thing with, um, you know, some of the cultural assessments that we have done, if there's an industry that we want to get into, hey, we would have to take some, we might have to eat some 50 or 100 hours of the cultural assessment and price it in a way that it looks very attractive to them because then they're going to give us more work. So pricing is all, it's all a strategy. When you're first starting out, you really have to think about what is it, where do we want to go? Where do I want to be? And how does that shape your your pricing, but also you don't want to come across like you're so low that people kind of lose respect for you, right? You, there's no way you can deliver on that. Right. So it, it, every everything that we have done has always been kind of like a strategy. We have a pricing strategy and says, okay, well, how do we need to price this? Do we need to price it in a manner that we're comfortable with the best value? Or two, 
do we need to price it in a way that is low enough that we can still do the work, but we're not going to make any money. Okay. Yeah. Um, another thing too, that I, I will challenge also people to think about too, is when we were first starting out and Hey, TIBC, the C is for consultants. Okay. Consultants are great, but you also know that if you're going to do that work for a very, very long time, you should really think about building a bench, right? Yes, and so, so that's what we have done with a culture assessment is that it's with a culture assessment, especially with some of the proprietary information is like, okay, I have built a team internally of like three, four people mm-hmm. to do the culture assessment. So we don't outsource really any of it. Um, for the coaching, um, we have built, we're starting to build a team where we are delivering a lot of the coaching uh, from our own internal team and using some consultants. So that's another, you know, pricing strategy too is try, you know, think about building your bench if you really want to do that for the long run. Right. No, and I like that because you're using a mix, you're using like a hybrid model, right? Right. Again, you start off with some consultants and then you kind of learn and then you start building your bench, but you're still using part consultants. And I'm sure that that percentage, right? It's like maybe 100% consultants, then it went 90% and then 70%, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Till eventually maybe it's 50, 50, or maybe even, you know, 40% consultant, 60% your bench. I like that. I, I like that. What other things for the small person that's starting out, what other warnings would you give them? I would say, because people, I'm going to take this risk. I'm going to do these things. What should I be afraid of? What should I be cautious? What should I what kind of things do I need to do? We understand I need to be procurement ready. What are, what other things am I missing that I don't know? I think I have, one of the things I have learned the, uh, the hard way is stop chasing stuff. Okay? Talk to me. Stop chasing shiny stuff. Ooh. Okay. What I mean by that is, it, oh, so let's go back to what uh, you were asking me about. Hey, you know, you can't be on like uh, energy 10 all the time. There's, there's another thing that uh, it can get you in big trouble is you don't do your homework, okay? You see a shiny, beautiful administrative support services, right, for 10 people, and then you go out and find a subcontractor, and then you start putting everything together, and then at the 11th hour, you read the PWS, and you realize on Monday morning, after you spend the entire weekend doing this, that, you know what, we're not ready for this. We are not ready to go after this because we didn't do the due diligence. Okay, there's an incumbent. And if it's released as a uh, women-owned small business, there's a women-owned small business next to the customer who wants to do that. And that women-owned small business has a lot of work with that. And they're uh, they're asking for very customized rest. And let me tell you, you know the reason why I know how to tell the story really well? And I know I'm my sure. teachers love me for this is because it just happened to us like very recently, yeah. uh, you know. And so, so we 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 dove into the um, to the to do to wanting to do this thing, and then there were little things that we missed, you know, that we didn't catch. And by the time we caught it, we had invested so much time. So one right. thing that I always tell people is, and I'm, I'm learning that as we go. I mean, we're learning it. Is build a pipeline, do your capture. Yeah, there's going to be some some here and there, but if you're going to respond to something, you got to have a solution. You got to know the customer. Do you have the past performance? So don't just put a proposal together. Just put a proposal together because the government is going to know if you have a lot of fluff in there. You got Mm -hmm. to solve a problem that they have. Do you know their environment, right? So that I think for me the biggest one would be you know. Build a plan, build a strategy. You know, one of the beautiful things of having an ISO process is that now we have a capture process. We have uh, a sourcing, we have staffing, we have security. Everything that we do in the company has a process that we have to follow. So that that really eliminates the chasing the shiny stuff. I like that. That's great. That's great. You work for a company. You decide to leave the company, you start your company, <laughs> you don't know pricing, you never read a business, but yet you knew you had the confidence that it would work out, but you had to support your family. 
Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And we had a small child too. So, you know, the day I decided to, uh, to take this leap of faith was I was commuting 78, 75 miles each way. And I couldn't tell it work. And I remember thinking, you know, there has to be something better, something better that I can do. And I had had my, my professional evaluation done, let's see, early 2014. It was like a 4.6, almost 5 though. Then I got this new leadership, and this was October 2014. And I got my, my uh, evaluation, and it was 3.5 or 3.3. It had gone down that much. And I was told that uh, I communicated too much. I was too direct and I have too much urgency to get things done. So at that moment, I said, you know what? I don't think I can make it in the corporate environment. Uh, you know, quote unquote, I'm just too mouthy. I'm too confident, you know? And I don't say that in a way that I just, you know, e to be egotistic. No, but, but you right. know, I just, I just, you know, from, from coming to, when my father sent me to the U.S., I was 15 years old. I went to four different, uh, no, three different high schools. I was sending a Greyhound bus from California to Georgia when I, I was 15 years old. I, I joined the military. I didn't learn, I did not know how to, how to speak English, okay? I was held in boot camp for a couple of weeks. I put myself through the Navy. I paid for my college, my master and all that stuff. You know, I said, you know what? I think I have a little bit of confidence. I can do this. <laughs> and so that's kind of how that decision happened is just, you know, just having confidence and just, just getting it done. How did you first, how, okay, now you did that. How did you learn, how did you learn 8A, GSA? How did you start learning all this stuff? Doing your homework developing relationship with a small business office. How did you even know the small business office? Uh, you know, you use federal contracting 101. Okay. Right. And that's another thing. That's another great point too, Eric, is, is uh, be intentional with your own education to start a business. Don't expect right. people to do it for you and to spoon feed you everything. Okay. You know, don't be going to people say, oh, hey, how do you do, Sam? How do you do dance? How do you do SDV, USB? There's so much information over there, right? You just have time to really ask great, great questions. So I did a lot of my homework. I, I developed a lot of relationship with local contractor, federal contractors here in the Fredericksburg area. Mm. And I would ask him a lot of questions. Hey, you, how did you do this? How did you do that? How did you do that? And uh, of course, when I would tell them that I didn't have any government experience and that I was leaving my corporate job, I would get a lot of teeth sucking. Have you heard of that? Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're going to leave your six figure job to do your wife is going to do what? Oof. Oh, man, she's crazy. Right. So, anyway, once I got past, once I got past that, is, uh, you know, they knew that I was really serious and that there was no going back. I just, I just did a lot of homework, right? And then when I felt that I really knew my stuff, that's when I started contacting the small business offices, right? And then you go to the small business events. Then you, you meet contracting officer. You right. follow up with them. Here's right. one thing that I used to do that many people don't do. Handwritten note. Some of those contracting officers that I will meet on mm -hmm. those events, and they will sit down with me to tell me, I will come back. Dear Joe, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for doing that. People that invest time with you, take a moment to... Like, remember the special things for them, right? For, for uh, you know, and, and say, hey, you know, I hope your son is doing okay. I hope they won their soccer game. I hope to see you soon. Hey, by the way, do you have a minute? Do you have some time for a 10 minute phone call? I mean, how can they be, how can they say no to you when you're already kind of send them a thank you note and really tr genuinely try to get to know them, you know? I can tell you, I really, I love handwritten notes. I had a, a podcast guest of mine send me a handwritten card. And I thought that was, fit. I mean, I just thought that was the best thing in the world. So, so we got to take it. I have, yeah. this is, I have cards over here too, you know? Yeah, I have and them. Like, this right is what up. I do. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's, I think we get away from our basics of what it takes to build a rapport with people and relationships. We're getting away from that because I, I hear so many people want, want to just send blind emails without knowing the person, without having never spoke to the person. Why they didn't respond back to me? <laughs> Different font, <laughs> oh. Joe, blue, and then the body black and aerial and time. Oh my gosh. 
<laughs> Delete. Yeah, no, that's that's good. That's true. I, I like that. I, that's a that's a good tip. I like that one. I like that tip. That's a good one. That's a good one. Um, no, I just again, I, I'm I'm truly fascinated. In fact, you know, just listening to your story, you make me want to put on a women's conference. Just just listening to your story, I'm like, wow, this is a great story. We need to have a women's conference. Yes. So that, so that we can, you know, get you and all of my other podcast guests in front of an uh, audience to share things that have, because I just, I think it's so valuable and I love, you. no one can tell your story like you can, but also what I found in my personal experiences, women and my courses do better than the men. Okay. And I also realized that women have had, there's been other, like you said, someone evaluated you, said you're too mouthy. There's other things that happen that I just can't relate to. Right. And I don't have that experience. And Mm-hmm. Someone like yourself could say that in front of a group of women and, and they all can relate. It's relatable. Does that make sense? Yes. And Eric, can I just add one more thing? Absolutely. To, uh, to the small businesses, because you know, this happens a lot where uh, businesses are starting up and then the husband and wife get involved, right? In the business and, uh, and which is fine. But I always tell people because in our, um, in our company, I'm the CEO uh, of, of the company. And my, my husband also works behind the scenes, right? He is, he, he kind of supports with the infrastructure, but there has always been a delineation that there has to be a chief who makes the decisions and that the team that supports that. And so I have heard time and time and time again, even from the customers, oh, so-and-so just had a fight. Okay. So, you know, so-and-so are married or something happened, didn't work out and everybody knows everybody's business and everybody knows now that, yeah, they're a small company and now they got two people fighting all the other stuff. I always tell people, it's like, you have 30 seconds to make a good impression and you have to, you have to determine, you have to decide what do you want that to be, right? And so if you're going to embark in a relationship, in a business relationship with many family members or, or, or spouses, that, that there are clear boundaries and people understand the expectations. So the dirty laundry doesn't bleed and it's not seen by people. And I know sounds kind of a little bit kind of basic, but I know that with small businesses, we do that a lot. No, it's great. I, I, know, it, I love the basics. Again, we need to be reminded. We need to remind the, the folks listening to this. Uh, we need to remind them of strategies, it, even again, even the basics that were the, their old principles that are foundational to, regardless of if you're doing business with the government or commercial or private sector, it doesn't matter. Why did you, uh, do you do state contracts, state and local? So we, uh, we have done a little bit of state. Um, so our goal now is to diversify more for the company. And uh, we are doing um, quite a bit of work and starting to do a lot of commercial work okay. for DEI trainings, cultural assessments, the the energy uh, uh, utilities for translation. So uh, we're starting to diversify quite a bit, quite a bit more. Okay. No, I just wonder because a lot of times what I hear from my audience is that they think that starting at the state and local area is easier for them. And that's, a, that's just an mm-hmm. assumption, not that it is true. So I'm just wondering, why did you not take that route? Why did you choose federal to start as opposed to a local or state? You know, I started actually with the uh, local immigration lawyers. What is that? Uh, they uh, to do translation. Okay, all right. So, so uh, my my focus really was okay. How can I get the quickest past performance so it can help my professional self esteem? Okay, because for me to wait two years to win a contract, it was just too much for somebody who's just so driven, right? So I needed to have small wins. So for me, it was like, okay, how do I get a small win of uh, you know, one birth certificate translation, which was 50 bucks, right? Or 75 bucks or hundred bucks. <laughs> and so what that did is I will do all those little things to keep me motivated. So I will not give up. And so that helped me to work up to that first contract that we got, which really, you know, it was not until 2016 that we won the first contract. Before that, those first two years, it was really little things. That kept us going. Okay. All right. I'm making notes, by the way. I like that. We're going to change the, the subject a little bit. Tell me something that you've purchased from Amazon recently. <laughs> so I love reading about culture. So I have, let's see, 
I have the stages, the four stages of psychological safety, I would say was uh, one of the latest ones that I bought. And then because uh, I work a lot with the government is uh, in doing culture assessment, building a winning culture in government was the other one. Never heard of those books. Yep. What's that first one about the four stages? Four stages of psychological safety is, uh, you know, how do you get psychological safety in your, um, in your team environment? I don't know how what do psychological do safety you... means. I don't know what yeah. that means. So psychological safety is, is basically where people come to work and they can be themselves. And they can, uh, they can, and they can really challenge you in a very respectful way, and you don't get offended. Okay, so let's let's say that you know we're having a discussion, and I feel that you know Eric, they're on the where you want to go might not be the best way to do it. There might be a better way, but you, but I may be the PM, and you are the CEO. Well, how do you have that? conversation with that person and feel safe and not feel that I'm going to be prosecuted and, and basically told you're too disrespectful. So psychological safety is creating the, an environment where people feel safe to speak up and right. hopefully make better decisions. Right. Okay. All right. What other books would you recommend or that you've gifted before to small businesses that's wanted to get into government contracting? Maybe that's unrelated to psychological safety. <laughs> or culture to workplace. Uh, are there any other books that you've read on that's related to government contracting or even building a business? Forget government contract, just business. Maybe it's a woman entrepreneur. Maybe it's a fiction story. Mm. See, I have a Lean Six Sigma background. So I would definitely encourage how to develop a strategy books, how to write a business plan, how to establish goals. Um, you know, I do a lot of reading on culture, but I think everything else, I have kind of built a, uh, a network of CEOs that I go to. Uh, uh, um, a network of CEOs that I can be me and that I can make, I can get help with some tough decisions. And, and so that's what I would definitely recommend. The hands-on approach, establishing a CEO network, one or two or three people. Like for example, for me, I have, there are three companies. One is a female and two gentlemen. And uh, that's what I typically go for. Hey, you know what? I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think of that? A lot of benchmark, best practices, benchmarking. Yep. Where did you learn that? My MBA class. Oh, it's a great yep. tactic. Uh, yep. um, it's like having a board of advisors. Yes. Unofficially. And just doing, I'm always reading, uh, you know, I will, I will have four or five or six books that I'm reading at the same time. Like I go back and forth, right? I go back and forth. And uh, because even though the cultural books might not be per se business books, there's so much that you can get out of those books that you can apply to the business world. So I will tell you one thing that I just read last night that I'm able to apply to the company. So when you're doing a project and you bid a project for 80 hours, and you have a customer who wants more and more and more and more, right? And then you start, well, you know what? So and so wants a special favor, and it's going to be five more hours. It's just five more hours, so we're okay with that. Well, then something else happened, and we're adding more and more. And the next thing you know, you're at a hundred hours, and you're only getting paid for eighty. You start bleeding money, okay? So that's a conversation actually that I had with one of my, my uh, with my employees this morning. Is that? You got to be focused on how many hours you bid on the contract, what labor categories. You still want to deliver excellence, but you want to set expectations. So that will be something that is learned from some of those culture books. I sound like I need a culture book. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. I need a culture book because that listen, that happens to me, even with the stuff that I do, is that people want more and more of my time. I think that happens to all of us, right? And they're like, hey. You know, I bought one of your programs. So, okay, I get a, you get a one hour call. Okay, great. Hey, can you ask this question? Can you answer this question? Can you, hey, I got this other situation. Hey, like, hey, you know, so yeah. it just, it goes into. And guess what? They go and tell their friends, oh, you know what, Eric, he's available 24 seven and we can do. And then next to you now, you have set expectations for them to right. receive the same level of service. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. It makes sense. It makes sense. I like that. Any sayings that you have, quotes, things that you that you say constantly, whether you told me about the one that your father said, or anything else that you say, like to your staff or family or. Yes, yes. All right. So every time that I go into a meeting, 
Okay. There has to be a purpose. Got to be a what? A purpose. Okay. So we don't count. We don't count to meetings just to have meetings. Uh, there has to be an agenda, and there has to be a setting the stage. So they, they laugh when I said, I come to a meeting. I said, okay, so we're here today. We're here from be, from from ten to eleven, and let's just go ahead and set the stage of why we're here. Because we want to make sure everybody understands why we're here and what are we looking to accomplish. At the end of the meeting, did we accomplish? So the joke in uh, in our team is setting the stage. Okay, now that they're starting to do the same thing. Okay, so let's just go ahead and set the stage for the meeting to make sure everybody understands why we're here and what do we want to accomplish. I like that. Yep. I like it. I like it. So since you're reading all those books, you're not getting time for Netflix? Oh, I love to watch Spanish stuff. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. So let me tell you. How do you balance? I'm looking for how you balance. <laughs> so, so one thing that is very important to me is uh, self-care. Okay. Okay. Self-care. And that is something that we don't do often. And uh, my team knows that I'm not really available before 8.30 or 9 o'clock. Okay. Why? Because my son leaves for school at 6.50. At 7 o'clock, I'm downstairs in the gym doing my body pump class, kickboxing, whatever. Uh, and then they know that after 5 o'clock in the afternoon, that's where I do all my strategy. When I'm running the dogs. I have two dogs, Dallas and Texas. And we go for a run. And so the mental care, and I always tell people, it's like, you've got to take care of yourself, Right. And people don't, they, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't want to listen with, with the fact that all of us need mental care. Okay. For the ladies. Okay. I'm big on, <laughs> you gotta get, I gotta go get my nails done. My nails getting done is like any other proposal getting done. Okay. I like it. Again, it goes back to the zoom meetings, right? You got 30 seconds to make a good impression. You know, you got to show up, uh, you know, the same thing, you know, take care to go on. And get your hair done to make yourself look, feel good. At the same time with the guys, go golfing, do go to the gym and stuff. So for me, is the self care. It is, it is imperative. It is non negotiable. So I like that. Are you like? I guess you told me, but do you? A lot of people work great in the mornings in terms of work, and then some people work great in the evenings. We call it early riser, burn them in that oil. What would you identify as? So I'm an, I'm an extrovert by choice and during the day. Okay. So when it comes down to when it's six, five o'clock in the afternoon, I kind of like decompress, time to hang out with the family, just calm down. So I typically, I'm, you know, I get up, I do really well in the mornings, I execute throughout the day, but then once it starts getting into 6 p.m., I need to recharge right 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 can you tell us an odd job that you've had before odd place you've worked at oh my gosh my first job when i came to the u.s was cleaning homes oh okay yep I how cleaned, old were you I, I was uh i remember 15 and a half i used to uh clean my neighbor's house wow okay that's not yep. bad yep my first job also after that was burger king Okay, you work at Burger King. Yep. I, work so at Burger I have King. no desire to have Whopper huh? with cheese. I'm like so over that Whopper oh, with you cheese. Oh, you say you're so <laughs> You don't look like you eat many Whoppers with cheese. Oh, yeah. I love, I used to love, 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 love Whopper with cheese. Oh, yes. So you just have to work out a whole different conversation. <laughs> you know, work... my aunt, my aunt, when the first aunt that I had that I moved with in California, uh, they, the perk and the recognition for helping her clean the house was Whopper with cheese. That was like, get the house clean because I'm going for the Whopper with cheese. I like that. I like mm -hmm. that. Well, if you weren't doing this, what do you think you'd be doing? Oh my gosh. This is such a hard question, Aaron, because I couldn't imagine staying at that job you know, no right? I couldn't imagine doing it because one of the things that I I, I failed to tell you uh, this really the biggest motivation of our lives is that we adopted a beautiful 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 little boy uh in 2010 
and he's he's like it for us. He's like our lives, you know. And I, I couldn't imagine doing anything else and not being able to get up in the morning, get him ready, you know, take him to the to the bus stop, picking him up, going to his judo. I mean, I couldn't imagine anything else besides what I'm I'm doing right now. So no, I think there's there's nothing else that I will be doing but this. Yeah, I saw that in um, the the video that you made, the promo where it talked about adopting the boy, and yes. also providing a place for veterans to come to work. Yes, yes. Yeah, I saw that in that video. So yep. I wasn't gonna let you finish without telling us a story. Oh my god! <laughs> I wasn't gonna. No, you know, you gonna, know my you know my, my weak spot, right? No, start that's crying okay. or something. Uh, but you know, on a uh, on a funny note to uh, to to tell you, uh, English as a second language has been such a just a fascinating experience for me because uh, I have had to learn so much slang. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people that I, I, I am notorious for taking a beautiful word and turning it into a profanity because I just don't know. <laughs> or, or just like being very literal with people when they're explaining anything like raining cats and dogs. I remember coming to the US and people start talking raining cats and dogs who left the gates open on 95. And I, I, I visualize everything. So if there's a funny aspect of Gene Payne, the CEO, uh -huh. this is a joke in my team. It's like, they don't use slang. They don't use any of that stuff because, because I don't get it. And right. I visualize everything. So I would I will stop him in the middle of the sentence and say, okay, I'm sorry, I don't get that. So what does that mean? So raining cats and dogs right. is like, really like raining cats and dogs? Cats and dogs. <laughs> no, 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 no. And so that's the funniest thing in our, in our uh, team. It's like people are just making fun of me because Gene doesn't get the slang. He it says it's raining cats and dogs. Okay, yes. wait. And you're yeah. right. You're right about that because I start learning Spanish as an adult and you do imagine, you're trying to picture the image in your mind of the word to make that connection. Yes, a very uh, little connection. That connection. Um, um, and I remember uh, I grew up in Miami, so we have a lot of Cubans. And they they say, me voy a llamar patra. And I'm like, what? What are they talking about? Like, the back? I'm like, but they called me from my back. It just didn't make any sense. Yeah. Oh, they were saying it. And so I, I get that. that. Matter what makes what you're saying to me makes perfect sense. That makes total sense to me. That makes total sense. I like that. Do you do any type of like annual reflections on the business or a retreat or anything that you go back and you look at how your year went, how your months went, and go back? Do you do any of that? Anything like that? Yes. Yes. Um, so we have a we have a strategy, we have a, a plan that we follow throughout the year. And then as we conclude this year, uh, we will do uh, kind of like an analysis of, okay, how do we end up compared to what can we do better next year? What do we need to be more successful? So, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. And because I'm respectful of your time, I want to give you oh, one. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, kickboxing, hair, nails, running with the dogs. Body pump. Body, what's body pump? It's a weight training class. Uh, okay. It's 55 minutes of nonstop weight training. It's phenomenal. I tell you, it will take out any frustration or any extra energy that you have. Any um, other tools that you use, like apps, software, things like that, that you've incorporated into your business now that small businesses, maybe they could, could learn to use it early on? Do you use like Dell Tech or GovWin, any of that stuff? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, but you know what? There's so much information out there that is free, that doesn't cost anything, right. especially for small businesses. Uh, you know, there is F FPDS, the Federal sure. Procurement uh, Database. That's a really big one to to uh, to look at. And there's the other ones is, I tell people, go to the forecast. For Every agency has a forecast. Right. And identify what areas, do you, who you want to do business with. And and, uh, and and kind of basically strategic, I said, okay, I want to do business with... Uh, the Department of Energy. I want to do business with the Department of Defense, and then start kind of, kind of looking through the forecast and and um, and making informed decisions of what do you want to focus on. Another thing that is really important to that many small businesses do not know is that if you're coming to the out of the corporate environment, that your individual professional experience actually does count, right, for the first two or three years of your business. 
So that is something that you can use as a past performance when you're submitting a proposal. And that's what I did when I first I was first starting um, the company is I used my own personal experience as diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. as part of that past performance. Oh, I love it. I love it. All right. We're going to tell small businesses, uh, leave them with some parting words and close out for today. Oh, wow. I, I would say. I know you're uh, going to slam dunk it this one. I would tell people you are the only person who can hold yourself back. You're the, the, you're the person who can hold yourself back. Do what you're passionate about and you'll be successful. I did it. I have heard of many people who have done it and you can do it too. I love it. And Eric, thank you so much for having me. This has been amazing. And, uh, and it definitely, it makes me stop and recognize how great this journey has been for the past almost seven years. And sometimes I don't do that. So thank you. Yeah. No, thank you for coming on. And thank you for sharing all those nuggets. And even before we even get started saying, hey, I want a platform to be able to share all this stuff with people. I hope that we are able to do that today to give you that opportunity to share those things. In fact, like I said, you, I've always had this in the back of my mind, but hearing your story made me even more say, hey, I think that, because again, I have an audience, I have a platform. I hear from a lot of women business owners, a lot of women entrepreneurs that are getting started. I think that we need to give them a forum to where they could talk, engage, and ask questions. So um, we definitely think we're going to have you back, if not in an in a actual conference, maybe on a, on a call with, we can invite women entrepreneurs, business persons, just to come on and hear from you and then ask questions. So. I, that you inspired me during that episode and I took a bunch of notes as I was writing as well. So. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. Well, so thank, thank you for thank uh, you. what you're doing. I mean, you know, business do enjoy telling their story and uh, hopefully uh, my story today has been an inspiration for others. And, you know, I'm here and available if anybody needs anything. So, and we'll make sure to have all of your contact information, your email, everything on the website. Uh, if you have not already received an email, from our staff, they will send you something um, to let you know where to send all your contact information. So we'll definitely have that available to everyone out there listening as well on our website, govconscience.com forward slash podcast.